Hi, thanks very much, and uh, I'd like to say how glad I am to be here doing the talk today. Um, uh, I'd also like to uh, say that this uh, talk is based on an article that's going to appear in the next issue of ISJ, so uh, uh, I'm going to be bouncing some ideas off you, so uh, I, I, hope you're, uh, I hope you're ready to feed back and, uh, and give me some critical, um, uh, critical advice. Um, so fracking, the future of energy, I think the world is really at the moment I think undergoing uh, a quiet revolution in the way that energy is produced and distributed. Thanks to the dramatic growth um, of exploitation of unconventional energy sources and particularly of shale oil and gas, fossil fuels that have been trapped in previously inaccessible uh, rocks underground. Um, now, at the moment, there's a lot of debate about whether or not this is just going to be another bubble that's going to burst. Is it really uh, viable uh, in an economic sense? Um, I, when I was researching this article, it seemed to me a lot of people, um, particularly uh, uh, people who are critical of the carbon economy, uh, base their positions on that this isn't uh, economically viable. Um, I disagree with that. I think it's too early to say, but it seems to me that, uh, that not only is fracking an economically viable model uh, uh, that can, can continue to exploit these, um, uh, these sources, uh, but that means that we are in very serious danger when it comes to considering the implications for that for runaway uh, climate change. Um, and I think that it's clear that corporations and states all across the world are preparing for the shifting balance of interests and alliances that this so-called shale revolution might deliver. Now, energy and control uh, over it and access to it have long played a crucial role in geopolitics. Oil has been the lubricant of capitalism for decades. Um, and discussing the imperial power's attitude towards oil in the aftermath of the Second World War and in the midst of decolonization, Chris Harmon pointed out that oil was the raw material of raw materials, the ingredient for manufacturing the plastics, the synthetic rubber and the artificial fibers, as well as providing for massively expanded energy needs and propelling the ever greater proliferation of motor vehicles, tanks and aircraft. And it was increasingly found in the Middle East in the area described by David Harvey as the global oil spigot. And so concerns about oil and access to it have played a role in a lot of interventions and military interventions over the years uh, in the post-Second World War period, uh, and particularly with the US, for example, in 1953, a coup against the democratically elected leader of Iran, uh, Mossadegh, was partly in response to his nationalization of the country's oil wealth. And this coup led to the restoration of absolutist rule under the Shah uh, and gifted US oil companies 40% of the formerly British concession. You could see the beginnings of a real shift in the balance of power in the region. And the importance of the region was very much underlined in 1980 um, by President Jimmy Carter in his State of the Union address where he said the region is now threatened by Soviet troops in Afghanistan, uh, is of great strategic importance. It contains more than two-thirds of the world's exportable oil. The Soviet Union is attempting to consolidate a strategic position that poses a grave threat to the free movement of Middle East oil. Let our position be absolutely clear. Any attempt by an outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interests of the United States of America, and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. And this underpinned um, American strategic um, uh, focus on the region for many years to come. Fast forwards to 1998, uh, Bill Richardson, who was uh, Bill Clinton's energy secretary, spelling out his policy regarding a pipeline to transport oil from the Caspian region, says this is about America's energy security. It's also about preventing strategic inroads by those who don't share our values. We've made a substantial political investment in the Caspian, and it's important that both the pipeline map and the politics come out right. So securing access to energy, and often equally importantly, denying access uh, to competitors has been an important factor in a lot of American policy, and so it remains. In February 2006, Obama, when he was a senator, made a speech on energy independence in which he said that US dependence of foreign oil was the Achilles heel of the most powerful country on earth, uh, the oil we cannot live without. And he went on to say that moving away from an oil economy is a major challenge that will require sustained national commitment. So fast forward six years, 
uh, the International Energy Association releases its World Energy Outlook, which found that the extraordinary growth in oil and natural gas output in the United States will mean a sea change in global energy flows. Uh, the United States becomes a net exporter of natural gas by 2020 and is almost self-sufficient in energy in net terms by 2035. North America emerges as a net oil exporter, accelerating the switch in direction of international oil trade, with almost 90% of Middle East oil exports being drawn to Asia by 2035. In this scenario that is being put forward as a potential outcome uh, by the uh, Energy Agency, uh, far from living uh, with the threat of being crippled by reliance of foreign oil, the US will become the world's biggest oil producer in four years' time. This represents a, potential, a potentially staggering transformation in the US's energy independence. And what is at the heart of some of this is that in the recent years, the rising cost of energy has spurred exploration for unconventional energy reserves. While technological improvements in a process known as hydraulic fracturing, which we all call fracking, um, has meant that deposits that were previously inaccessible are becoming easier to exploit. Uh, other countries around the world have rushed to embrace the technology in order to exploit their own deposits of unconventional fuel. So Alan Riley um, argues in the New York Times that the ramifications of this shale revolution could be enormous. The major geopolitical impact of the shale extraction technology lies less in the fact that America will be more energy self-sufficient than, than in the consequent displacement of world oil markets by a sharp reduction in US imports. This is likely to be reinforced by the development of shale oil resources in China, Argentina, Ukraine, and other places which will put additional pressure on global oil prices. So cumulatively, these changes point towards enormous geopolitical shifts um, as energy exporters vie for new markets and importers for, for influence. But behind these headlines are serious concerns. Worries about the environmental impact of the shale revolution extend from the impact on local communities and landscapes all the way to fears about the damage that will be done to the climate by such a massive extension of fossil fuel extraction. Uh, these unconventional fossil fuels are likely to unleash runaway climate change that could put pay to hopes of a low cost and low risk energy future, as the Guardian Energy blog put it. Indeed, the shale revolution has pushed much of the debate about renewable energies to the sidelines, uh, as well as pushing many firms developing renewable energy into bankruptcy. Last year, more than 40 solar power companies went bust. Now, while there's a lot of debate about exactly how much of the hype surrounding shale is accurate, even if the reports released so far are overestimating its potential impact, the notion of peak oil, the time at which oil production reaches its highest point before entering terminal decline, must at the very least be postponed by many years. Far from being able to re rely on declining oil reserves, as some environmentalists have done in the past, to counter global warming, there is, in George Monbiot's words, enough oil in the ground to deep fry the lot of us and no obvious means to prevail upon governments and industry to leave it in the ground. Uh, and Nick Butler, writing in the Financial Times, said that the climate change lobby has to adjust too. The shale gas revolution is in the process of lowering the cost of using hydrocarbons just when they wanted the reverse to happen. I think for these reasons, critics of the carbon-driven capitalist economy must take the shale revolution very seriously since it increasingly sets the terrain upon which we have to fight for the future of the planet. Now, the enormous increase in shale oil and gas production has been spurred by rising oil prices. Oil prices depend on a number of intertwined factors, demand, financial speculation, and output decided by OPEC, the cartel of major oil producing states. Uh, and since 1998, oil prices have trended upwards sharply and are today around 10 times higher than they were 15 years ago. So oil prices reached a low of $10.72 in December 1998 and hit a peak of $147.30 in July 2008. Now, prices had increased over a decade as production lagged behind, thanks largely to China and India's dramatic growth rates and uh, use of uh, fossil fuels uh, and instability in the Middle East, which led to a decline in uh, Iraq's uh, oil output uh, from the Iraqi oil fields. But the global economy had already begun to slow before the peak in 2008. So what propelled that spike? Well, the Energy Information Administration, which is the US government body responsible for statistical analysis 
um, of energy, pinned part of the blame on volatility in Venezuela and Nigeria. It warned of an influx in investment money into commodity markets. And I think that this was one of the crucial elements as investors were stampeding out of the falling real estate and stock markets. Uh, and instead, they diverted their funds into oil futures. And this sudden surge drove up oil prices, creating a speculative bubble, which caused real concerns for OPEC. OPEC have a very difficult balancing act. You know, in order to maximize profitability, they need to maintain relatively high oil prices. But if prices get too high, it threatens to make alternative energy sources look more and more attractive. So Saudi Arabia announced an increase um, in its oil production in 2008. And one of the reasons why they did that uh, is that they were saying that people were starting to get very worried about the fact that soaring fuel costs were inciting demonstrations and protests in places from Italy to Indonesia. Now, within months of the collapse of Lehman Brothers uh, and the precipitous decline in global production that followed, oil prices plummeted rapidly, hitting just $32 a, day, uh, a barrel by December 2008. But again, a combination of speculation and reduced output um, from OPEC, who cut their production quotas uh, in December 2008, and continuing demand from China meant that they started to rise again. So now they're back at around $100 um, a barrel. And it was this trend of high oil prices which led to the growing profitability of unconventional sources such as fossil fuels. The danger of deep sea oil drilling, I think, was brought into sharp focus with the uh, explosion on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig, which killed 11 workers and caused an enormous uh, oil spill into the Gulf of Mexico. We've also seen Arctic drilling uh, becoming an increasingly attractive prospect. Um, uh, John Sorvin wrote in the Guardian of the, of the size of the site of this, while icebergs the size of football stadiums are towed out of a rig's path, ships equipped with high pressure water cannons blast smaller chunks into submission, and all the while the clock is ticking. As the winter freeze edges nearer, the frantic exploration company rushes to finish the job before ice sheets cut off the region completely. In March of this year, the Obama administration barred Shell from returning to the Arctic after a report found that the corporation's failure to make adequate preparations for an expedition last year led to the grounding of one of their drilling rigs. But despite this, the administration's national stra uh, strategy for Ar the Arctic region, released in May, focuses on, the administration, on how the US can manage the exploitation of the region's vast untapped oil, gas, and mineral resources in cooperation with other Arctic powers, setting out to position the United States to respond effectively to challenges and emerging opportunities arising from significant increases in Arctic activity. The twisted logic at play here is that since global warming is leading to the shrinkage of the Arctic ice sheet, this means that it's easier to drill for more oil in the region, which might, you, some of you might recognize, possibly lead to further shrinking in the Arctic ice sheet. Uh, another area uh, of unconventional uh, uh, oil exploitation is in Alberta, Canada, um, uh, where the tar sands are being used, uh, extracting bitumen in order to create a synthetic variety of crude oil. This, uh, the expansion of this uh, process has heralded one of the biggest industrial operations on the entire planet. The scale of it is absolutely phenomenal. It has seen enormous deforestation and pollution of water sources in the area, threatening the habitats of First Nation indigenous people. And the developments around tar sands in Canada have created serious problems for the Obama administration as pressure is put on him regarding the 1,179 mile Keystone XL pipeline that would transport tar sands oil to refineries and ports uh, in, uh, the U on the US Gulf Coast. And in the biggest environmental rally in US history earlier this year, 40,000 uh, protesters gathered in Washington to demand Obama reject plans for the pipeline. They pointed out that uh, leaking pipelines, such as one in 2010, uh, a pipeline leaking uh, going through Michigan, uh, burst and dumped 877,000 gallons, uh, costing over $1 billion to clean up, a process that still hasn't been completed. But the most significant development, of course, is, uh, has been the dramatic increase in the production of shale oil and gas in the US. Shales are fine-grained sedimentary rocks that trap oil and gas within them. And it's released 
through this process of fracking. The process of drilling down before a high pressure water mixture is directed at the rock to release the gas or oil inside. Water, sand and chemicals are injected into the rock at high pressure which allows the gas or oil to flow out of the head of the well. The process is carried out vertically or more commonly by drilling horizontally to the rock layer. The process can create new pathways to release gas or oil and can be used to extend existing channels. That's how the BBC describes the, uh, describes the process. And if you look at their um, website, they have a remarkable short video which shows the incredible technological um, uh, expertise that's used in terms of 3D imaging underground, the use of horizontal drilling, uh, and all of this kind of stuff. Now, hydraulic fracking has been used in the state since 1949. Uh, when Halliburton began the first, true, the first two treatments in Texas and Oklahoma. But since 2006, there has been an explosion in the production of shale oil and gas. Um, shale gas wells produced 0.3 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in 1996, which was 1.6% of total natural gas production. This figure um, had jumped uh, by... Um, Sorry, this figure had more than tripled to 1.1 trillion cubic feet um, uh, and 5.9% just a few years later. Uh, and in 2011, the EIA estimated total production at 7.85 trillion cubic feet, a whopping 34% of total production. So that's the scale of it uh, today. Uh, and it's estimated to rise to around 50% of the total by 2040. Um, and tight oil from shale would see a similarly dramatic rise with a projected uh, increase from 0.82 million barrels a, a day in 2010 to 2.81 million barrels in 2020 uh, and then declining to 2.02 uh, by 2040. So these are the dramatic increases behind the headlines um, about fracking uh, and the shale revolution. But there are some people, as I said earlier, who think that the figures are just too good to be true and that the shale revolution is actually a bubble. One of the most vocal critics um, of the shale revolution is the geologist and energy uh, consultant Arthur Berman. Now, he says that the rapid development of shale plays, almost fell over there, <laughs> which is the name given to um, uh, areas where oil and gas can be extracted from shale formations, has similarities to a gold rush. So he says that shale plays in the state share many characteristics with gold rushes of the 19th and 20th century. Both phenomena result from extreme promotion. Anyone can join. Every participant believes they will get rich. Great amounts of capital are destroyed as entrants try to get a position. The bonanza is exhausted sooner than most expected and few profit in the end except for the vendors that serve the participants. So small operators who are able to use technological developments in horizontal drilling to increase extraction to meaningful levels at first from the barn at oil field in Texas and then other places around the country um, found themselves attracting a flood of investment from Wall Street uh, and increasing competition. Natural gas prices reached an all-time high of $10.80 per cubic uh, thousand cubic feet in June 2008 and in line with global oil prices this crashed to 5.87 by December, a drop of 46 percent. Um, but unlike oil prices, gas has continued to go down. By April 2012, it was as low as $1.89. Um, the New York Times reported that the drillers punched so many holes and extracted so much gas through hydraulic fracturing that they have driven the price of natural gas to near record lows. And because of the intricate financial deals and leasing arrangements that many of them struck during the boom, they were unable to pull their foot off the accelerator fast enough to avoid a crash in the price. Uh, Arthur Berman at the time argued that the continued drilling has been funded by debt, share offerings, uh, but thus far the trend is unsustainable. And gas producers were certainly feeling the pinch just last year. And the chief executive of ExxonMobil, who had spent $41 billion to buy a natural gas company uh, uh, in 2010, uh, said that we are losing our shirts today. We're making no money. It's all in the red. Now, gas prices then began to rise in 2012 and saw a dramatic upswing in early 2013 between February and May. Uh, gas prices increased by more than 31%. And this partly reflected the fact that the uh, glut of output after the initial rush into shale had adjusted to low prices. The number of rigs drilling for natural gas in the US <coughs> fell to a 14-year low. Um, 
and the, the count of rigs going was about one quarter of its peak in 2008 by early uh, this year. Um, and this restriction of new supply coming online stems from that low, uh, from the low prices of the last few years. So the new prices were within the zone of profitability for the extraction of shale gas. Now another pressing objection to the viability of shale revolution is that shale plays decline very, very quickly. Studies by uh, a number of critical economists um, uh, suggested that decline rates are so precipitous and the capital investment required so substantial um, that the massive amount of oil and gas in the ground is just uneconomical to produce. Um, uh, one uh, st a study by David Hughes calculates decline rates of between 79% and 99%, sorry, 95% in 36 months, uh, requiring $42 billion of investment to maintain output, higher than the total value of shale produced in 2012. But there's another side to this argument. A recent study by the University of Texas funded by the not-for-profit uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, looked at the output from the Barnard Shale Formation, and the report said that it is among the first to study the geology and economics of shale drilling, looking at the data from actual wells rather than relying on estimates and extrapolations. The study broadly confirms conclusions by the energy industry and the US government, which in December forecast rising gas production. In fact, the study found that the Barnard Shale play had significantly more technically recoverable gas remaining than had previously been estimated, 67 trillion cubic feet. Uh, in response to the report, uh, Arthur Berman told the Wall Street Journal that this research is probably the most comprehensive study of the Barnard Shale that will ever be done. But he said that it also raised questions about why the industry didn't identify the so-called sweet spots, the areas that allow wells with much greater output, um, which are economically viable initially before spending $40 billion on land and wells. Well, I think that this is the, one of the key issues uh, shaping the shale revolution and, and one of the key issues as to why it is becoming increasingly economically viable. Um, as one pundit uh, said, it, it began with a small independent oil and gas company. Its success in cracking the code of the Barnard Shale led to its acquisition by a bigger company uh, and a rapidly expanding company that was seeking new opportunities. And as the shale boom mushroomed beyond Barnard to other plays, um, other uh, independent operators, including newly formed companies backed by private equity funds, were leading the parade. The high initial production of newly drilled wells in these fields excited investors who were willing to provide tons of capital to these small companies. The operators also agreed to aggressive drilling commitments, which further cranked up the euphoria surrounding the shale boom. But as production fell, natural, uh, uh, sorry, as production rose, natural gas prices began to slump. But sh early shale well results began to reveal that they were not evenly distributed. This is when they started to realize that you had to go to certain areas. And the larger aggressive independence moved to secure uh, stable sources of capital in the form of joint ventures with major oil companies seeking reserves, production and technolo technological knowledge. Some of the small operators sold out to the larger companies and with gas prices at low, uh, low levels, companies of all sizes began sorting out their asset bases, selling less desirable properties. Today we're in the midst of a major restructuring of the energy industry, as shale technology leaders saddled with the high cost of capital are being absorbed by larger oil and gas companies with low costs of capital, large research and development budgets to fund further improvements in drilling and the financial staying power to withstand the time uh, until natural gas prices rise. What we're seeing, in the words of the Russian revolutionary theorist Nikolai Bukharin, uh, is the increasing centralization of capital, the joining together of various individual capital units which thus form a new larger unit. As the smaller pioneers of the shale business are incorporated uh, into their firms, proven reserves continue to grow as technological innovation allows for greater access to fuel in the ground. Massive leaps forward in computer imaging allow for greater accuracy, tighter concentration of wells in sweet spots and increasing the number of stages pumped. Uh, if the shale revolution plays out in this way, I think it's fair to say that arguments about peak oil and peak gas become uh, decreasingly relevant in the short term. 
Uh, one market analyst has argued that high horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing have resulted in a big upward revision in reserves and ultimately recoverable resources. The shale revolution has doubled estimates of global gas resources and will probably have the same impact on the oil industry. Peak oilers emphasise the total amount of oil and gas below ground is fixed. While that is true in a fundamental sense, the volume of hydrocarbons is so vast that it will last for centuries long after the planet has been cooked by global warming. Um, and so summarising the future of the shale industry, Nick Butler in the Financial Times says prices will be volatile. That is the nature of many new commodity market developments. There will be a boom and then the first overinflated bubble will burst, which is what has been happening in the US. But then, as so many times in economic history, the pieces will be picked up and consolidated and an enduring industry will emerge around more stable prices. And already states around the world have been preparing for this eventuality. So in 2012, uh, Obama claimed that the shale revolution would support more than 600,000 jobs by the end of the decade. And in the speech, he vigorously pushed a vision of a strategy that develops every available source of American energy, a strategy that's cleaner, cheaper, and full of new jobs. More recently, Obama has given uh, support for increased exports of natural gas, prompted in part by higher natural gas prices in Europe and East Asia. So they've uh, authorized the Freeport LNG uh, project in Texas to export to countries that do not have a trade agreement with the US. And prior to this being approved, uh, the only other LNG terminal to, uh, to have received the same was one that had originally built as an imports terminal, which has been rapidly retooled, which shows the speed at which states are preparing for a transformation in global energy flows. Uh, the US's newfound abundance of energy, however, is having dire effects on Russia's gas industry. Demand for its output has plummeted. The continuing economic slowdown has exacerbated the problem as crisis hit Europe has seen a de decrease um, in its LNG imports, which are around 27% in the last year alone. This is also being reinforced by the fact that American coal exports are becoming cheaper and cheaper because of the availability of gas. And so the European Union is importing very, very heavily polluting coal in very large uh, quantities. Um, but the immediate impact of these developments has been the abandonment last August of Russia's state-owned Gazprom's production scheme in the Barents Sea, a project that just months ago had been described by Putin as being of global significance. Now, given Russia's reliance on energy exports as both an economic motor and a means of developing political leverage, these events are a major challenge to Putin and the Kremlin. Um, the shale revolution also poses significant challenges in Europe. Um, Europe remains uh, still in the thrall of Russian gas dependency uh, and imports. Uh, and while Europe's gas prices continue to soar, as I've said, American prices are falling much, much lower, about half of the level that they are um, uh, in Europe. Uh, Alan Riley in the Financial Times says that Europe will become the only big economic bloc without significant energy resources. The US, India, China and Latin America will all have access to shale as well as offshore fossil fuels. So what about Britain? A recent British geological survey report put the amount of shale gas under the UK as 250 times that of previous estimates. Uh, enough to make us uh, self-sufficient in gas for centuries. But fracking in Britain faces uh, very different uh, challenges uh, than in the United States. Uh, areas where there are shale deposits, such as uh, Lancashire, are far, far more densely populated than the shale fields in the US. And campaigns against the kind of environmental damage that you see, the leakage of gas and methane uh, into water, into the soil, uh, even earthquakes, um, and protests against this, such as Camp Frack, which took place in May, a galvanizing opposition to these drilling projects. Now, of course, this hasn't prevented the Tories from very, very enthusiastically taking up the cause of fracking. Um, Boris Johnson recently said, if reserves of shale can be exploited in London, we should leave no stone unturned or unfracked in the cause of keeping the lights on. I mean, you're talking about going from uh, these exploitation plays in the States where there's no one for miles and miles and miles around. I mean, we're talking hundreds of miles around 
to drilling in London. I mean, it's really <laughs> fracked in the head. Um, but Europe uh, will benefit from lower LNG prices due to greater US exports, but it'll also start to face uh, expectations um, that it'll pick up more of the cost, both economically and militarily, of overseeing the stability of oil flows from the Middle East. Um, Robert McNally of the Rapidan Group um, and a former White House policy official says the prospect of energy self-sufficiency is going to reinforce calls to reduce the expenditure of US blood and treasure to protect the Middle East and the sea lanes that link it to its main consuming markets. And this is also a major issue facing China. China is reckoned to have abundant energy available in shale formations, 50% more than in the US, um, according to the EIA. But exploiting it is taking much, much longer um, than had originally been hoped. Partly the problems are geographic, shale deposits are in areas where there isn't a lot of water, um, but there are also bureaucratic problems presented by the state machine. Um, China has become increasingly reliant on imports of crude oil from the Middle East and has been building political relationships to help underpin this, particularly with Iraq. Iraq's first major oil deal in 2008 uh, was a three billion contract with China's National Petroleum Company. And more recently, the EIA's chief economist spoke of a new trade access being formed between uh, Baghdad and Beijing. Now, while the US would be very keen to shift the cost of um, military policing of the Middle East's oil gateway, uh, the Strait of Hormuz, it's unlikely to cede uh, this area to rivals. For one thing, because, a, uh, because oil is traded globally, a supply disruption or development anywhere in the world affects oil prices for all consumers. So even if the US were to import little oil because of a homegrown energy boom, Americans would still be vulnerable to global events uh, that raise the price of oil. And moreover, the US is troubled by the threat to its hegemony that China represents. Obama has embarked on a strategic pivot to Asia in order to respond to this threat, while China's ability to project military power overseas is still dwarfed by the US. It's more likely that the US will use its position of dominance in the Middle East as leverage with Beijing. So in addition to the US's pivot to Asia, uh, this is adding to tensions in the South China Sea, an area that China is incredibly keen to exploit. Its Ministry of Land and Resources estimates around 40 billion tonnes of oil equivalent in the area. Um, but this area is also claimed by Vietnam, uh, which has accused China of harassing its oil prospecting ships. Uh, and already China has fired diplomatic shots across the US's bow, saying we hope that countries that are not parties to the South China Sea dispute truly respect the efforts of the countries concerned to resolve their disputes through consultation. So the world's changing energy map is likely to lead to more and not to less instability in the years ahead. Sudden shifts and disruptions uh, in supply will continue to have big impacts on prices and despite its growing energy self-sufficiency, self there will be no slippage uh, of the US into isolationism. So to sum up, um, it's clear that the shale revolution is reshaping energy policy and geopolitical alliances. This in itself is a matter of great concern, but the fundamental challenge that it poses is that of climate change. We need urgently to reduce carbon emissions in order to avoid catastrophic climate change. We recently discovered that uh, carbon uh, in the atmosphere was at its highest level uh, in, in uh, millennia. However, the shale revolution is now being trumpeted by some as a means of reducing emissions. They're saying, for example, um, let's see, um, uh, William Press, a member of the, uh, the Obama Council of, of Advisors on Science and Technology, said that natural gas is the only way to achieve the president's climate change goals, which are in themselves wholly inadequate. But people are saying that because uh, they're less polluting than coal and oil, using gas is going to be a step forward. Even uh, the environmentalist Fred Pierce has argued that fracking for shale gas can provide a crucial bridging role until renewables come online. However, shale gas is not being lined up as a bridging fuel. If anything, its abundance is going to kick large-scale um, development of renewables further into the long grass. There is hope, though, that campaigns against fracking might provide a new spark for the climate movement. The Oscar-nominated documentary Gasland, which is about to have a sequel uh, released, brought home the dangers that fracking presents 
to local environments. In the US and in Britain, we've seen protests like the 40,000 strong rally in Washington in February and Camp Frack in Lancashire in May. And linked to wider social movements and workers' struggles against austerity, such campaigns could possibly revitalize calls for the creation of climate jobs that could rapidly bring online large-scale renewable projects. But larger questions are raised by this. The entire question of why is it that in the face of ecological meltdown, fossil fuels from the most unconventional sources are seen as preferable to large-scale decarbonisation. And that comes down to the profit motive and the anarchy of the market. It is increasingly apparent that large-scale democratically planned production is the only way out of the climate crisis and the grip of the fossil fuel industry. The shale revolution might be changing the energy map, but ultimately we will need a very different kind of revolution, a socialist revolution, if we are to change the world and save it for future generations. Thank you. If they will live in London, do you thought that the no hydrocarbon are bearing positives on clay and shale? Uh, sorry, it's all clay and uh, and uh, chalk. Uh, so, so far, Sean's on the loser there. But regarding what I think the, the word that comes through Johnny's contribution continually is the word speculative. Because if you look back at uh, the energy economy receives working nationally in my work, and you just look at energy reserves on a global scale, it's quite clear that everybody lies about energy resources and their exploitable uh, value. Uh, nation states, depending on the Charlie Metzbolts lie about the reserves. Uh, companies extracting oil uh, boast about the, the availability of them, then they claim that the extraction costs are too high. And people play a game of this, 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 this roulette continually, uh, at the heart of which is, is essentially a matter of uh, global power. It's a capitalist uh, Russian roulette. Uh, in which the Russians are on the sideline. But the thing about oil, I think that uh, Johnny pointed out, if you look at the history of imperialism, it's virtually the history of oil. Imperialism really starts with, with, uh, with, with the extraction of oil, the international trade in hydrocarbon fuels, starting from the Caspian in the, in the uh, turn of the 19th, 20th century. Well, one thing I would add to, to this is, is really the, the, um, the reality that even with enhanced um, extraction, even with fracking, even with um, uh, horizontal drilling or slant drilling, even with, with, uh, with the, the injection of chemicals and solvents, the, there is a ceiling on the extraction level possible from any geo, geo, uh, uh, hydrocarbon deposit. That's only 35% of what is actually there. And whenever ge geological surveys or companies actually say there's, uh, there's this gas or oil in place, it's always a, a small proportion of the actual total of what can actually can, sorry, the actual proportion of what can be extracted is actually only uh, about 35 percent of what is, there, is actually there. I think the thing that is uh, just a background thing, and I'll be very very quick, is, is that the real the real motor for change here is really the, the American shared imperative and consensus, which really is to try to get the U.S. energy efficient self-sufficient by about 2030. And this has actually led to a disengagement, I think, geo 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 uh, geographically, regarding the way it sees its distribution of power. But also, the, the way in which it can actually um, subcontract much of, its, much of its interests to, uh, to, to companies and, and its military cohorts in other parts of the world in order to make sure that the energy map remains firmly within, within its control. The other final point I, I would make out is that the is that, that basically what uh, fracking and, the, and and shale and, and the um, the tar sands is actually doing is introducing a degree of environmental liberalism in, in line with the neoliberalism of, of, of global ec economic management, which is actually going to deepen and worsen the environmental crisis. There is a, a recklessness. In, in the, in this, in this, which comes from the assumption that there's an infinite resource of energy. Peak oil was always a fantasy. It was always a fantasy to try to keep up the price of oil and justify its constant continual exploitation. But the thing is that this the fantasy is going to continue with the irresponsible extraction, <coughs> speculative extraction. It's going to be a wild west in many areas um, where, where there's going to be very little gain in exchange for which there's been considerable amounts of human and environmental cost. Um, can, can I, just before I 
have made my comments. Uh, recommend that book. I don't know if you can all see it here, The Burning Question. I gave uh, a talk very recently to my uh, Leeds SWP branch and used a number of resources, but I had about 40 post it notes in that for references. I mean, it's absolutely a brilliant book in, in my view. Um, point I wanted to make uh, was that um, I think it was a really illuminating talk, very convincing. Uh, is it took me back to when, in my 20s, when I was in the International Socialist, and we used to occasionally say, do you think we'll ever achieve socialism in our lifetime? Uh, and amongst my peers at the time, it seemed to be a fairly safe bet to say, well, probably, but we'll have to see how it turns out. You reckon we have 50 or 60 years left uh, to live. Now, at the other end of my life, uh, and I asked the same question, uh, it's, it's a different answer in a way, because we actually have to achieve uh, socialism in the next... 15 to 20 years, or we will we will descend into the barbarism, the last phase of which I guess we saw in the 30s, but it'll be a different sort of barbarism, which is brought about by climate change uh, because the fossil fuel uh, revolution that's going on at the moment and the passing of the peak oil argument really for the next 15, 20 years will ensure that there'll be significant constraints on developing uh, renewables. Renewables will get invested in, but nowhere near the amount that will be needed. And so irreversible climate change, within 15, 20 years, certainly, probably not me, but certainly my children, uh, and certainly in the lifetime of a lot of you here, uh, will become irreversible. At the same time, and you didn't mention it, but I'm sure it's in the back of your head as well, key other resources will be going into the end game. There will be very sharp increases in prices of all sorts of uh, rare metals, uh, the, uh, the rare earth elements, which you probably read about in the paper. Japanese have found a lot of them, uh, which has uh, lifted the, uh, the pan almost panic scarcity because they're essential for things like mobile phones and computers. The trouble is all these uh, rare earths at the bottom of uh, uh, the Pacific Ocean, about 30,000 meters to 30,000 feet down. So will require enormous amounts of energy to, to exploit them. So there'll be a convergence in about 20 years' time. And it's difficult not to be apocalyptic, but it seems to me it's an evidence-based apocalypse, apocalypse, not a religious-based apocalypse. And so I do think it's beholden upon us to, to really bend our wills to the bloody wheel, you know, and build our shoulders rather to the wheel, and do what we can to achieve that goal that I think we're all want, which is social, but it's got to be within 20 years or so. Thank you. There are questions of political activity that follow from what Johnny has been saying in his wonderful talk. At Kent Frack this May, we decided at a big meeting, and we decided to replace a NIMBY movement. We said this will be a NOP movement, not on my planet. And I think this is going to be very important because if you look at the movement to stop climate change, the, we were enormously set back in 2009 because everybody was looking to the governments of the world to do things. And particularly, the activists were looking to Barack Obama and the nations of the global south to do things. And we were utterly betrayed, and the decision was made that nothing would be done on the global level about climate change and carbon dioxide. That was made at a meeting of Barack Obama, Zuma, Lula, Manmohan Singh of um, India, and the president of China. Those five people, Obama and the Global South, decided on behalf of capital that there would be, that the, their competition with each other was so great that they could not afford the extra cost of renewable energy. Because the, the market will, the lesson of the shale revolution, the market will not solve this unless there is mass, what we need is massive government intervention. Because renewable energy and public transport are more expensive because they require more jobs. There are more jobs for the likes of us if, if we go down that. So it requires it's government intervention. But what do we do in the wake of 2009 and the betrayal from the top? We build a mass movement from below. And in the United States and Canada, that has been built uh, in important ways over the XL pipeline and over shale gas. 
And they started with uh, indigenous communities protesting about the pipeline, other demonstrations by environmentalists, other demonstrations against fracking. That gave rise to the Idle No More movement and the indigenous communities of Canada. The Idle No More movement in Canada and in the northern United States, they have taken over the great shopping malls. In Minnesota, they took over the largest shopping mall in the world with 50 people with drums starting the demonstration and with every single person in the shopping mall and every worker in the shopping mall joining that demonstration. This is something we have not yet done in this country, but we will do before we're through. And th that, the result of that was the first demonstration in Washington over climate change that they had ever had in the United States. It revitalized the climate change movement. It has the potential to do that here. And that means that when we're fighting climate change here, we start with what we're already doing. We are very much part as revolutionaries with many, many other sorts of people in the campaign for one million climate jobs. In a campaign to do something about austerity and to give us jobs and to stop climate change. But at the same time, we have to be part of the direct action movement um, against uh, fracking. And that does not simply mean selling them socialist workers, although it does mean that. <laughs> it does not simply mean arguing with them politically, although it does mean that. It means getting nicked alongside them. And the um, No Dash for Gas campaign, who had 21 people nicked for stopping a new gas-fired power plant for a week and costing the company billions, I think. I don't know if they're this costing company in North Sound Time. They, none of them went to prison because the judge knew the size of the movement that that would produce. They are having a no dash for gas camp this summer, 16th to the 20th of August. We are going to go there and we are going to be part of that because if you look at, the, if you look at what's been happening in the files up in Lancashire, where the first fracking has been coming in, what you have is a movement of environmentalists engaged in direct action with enormous backing from the Northwest TUC. Camp Frack was full of environmental activists from little threatened communities, the great majority of whom had never been involved in anything before this came to their village, but it was organized, put on, and paid for by the trade union movement in the Northwest. And that is the unity that we require, and we can, by starting that way, we can rebuild the climate movement. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? I really appreciate the uh, Jamie Jones' style of telling, telling this horror story. And believe you me, it is a horror story. It started out uh, with it being an environmental issue. And fittingly, he uh, moved towards. Um, let me put it in the uh, right order. Uh, probably economic or political. Um, and then it became uh, extremely social because it was affecting everybody. And, uh, um, he see, and then he tidied it up with uh, a little bit of uh, uh, environment, em environmentalism again. But I want to reopen that debate because I think it is uh, a catastrophe that is to do with uh, well, monopoly capitalism is supported by <coughs> rival state powers. That um, I, I would say, let, let's go back to the uh, future and the past. Let's call it the thirties, the build-up to the Second World War. Um, I would go as far as the Star Wars arms race, and furthermore, I would like to. Uh, mentioned the word imperialism, which is the area that Jeremy Jones touched upon, which is Vietnam and China, because I think, I, I'm actually from there, I, I was born in Vietnam, and, uh, but my whole orientation is towards this area again, because I think this is the, the, the most, it, it's a fault line in our social and political and economic history. Um, now, I, I don't want to just make this schematic because I, I need to get into it a little bit more. Firstly, when the, the fracking thing came about, I, I wasn't too interested because I, I don't, being a girl, I don't like drilling, I don't like things that are dirty and horrible, and I would go into that 
technical fascination, except that I was thinking about uh, the people involved, right? And the reason, uh, my point being is that I think there is a connection, there is an interlocking, of the, it's a theoretical uh, venture. Firstly, uh, <coughs> first, uh, because the, 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 the first thing is, is not in my backyard, but more than anything is the middle class uh, revolution again, in the sense that it will affect people's property, so they will hear who will cry about it. And then you mentioned something about the indigenous people, and it's always the weak and the vulnerable who are affected because it's the environment. And then I was thinking more of uh, how, how it's taken away the oil revenue of uh, emerging third world countries such as uh, Venezuela and, and Russia because they need capital like anything. And I was thinking how much that affected, especially the, the, uh, the Japanese revolution of using that capital for social enterprises. But of course it's not socialism per se, but it's connected to the lecture tomorrow. And then I, I wanted to say something about the area that uh, it is up for, shall we say, dispute, which is the, um, the South China Seas and the Spratly Islands. And this is very perfect. Uh, the, the, the theory, the, the Alex Klinikos's theory of imperialism, where the intersection of, uh, of, of um, uh, what do you call it, geopolitics and, and economic interests come together, and it, it will be. I mean, it's, it's going to be the second wave of imperialism after the American War in Vietnam, obviously. Um, so, so to to to, uh, to to summarize a little bit, I just want to say that the, the Mary Shelley's notion of the monster getting out of hand, and I think the monster in this case is the market itself, and and that that search for profits, and that's I think it's going to. I'm so I'm so anxious in the sense that I try not to be apocalyptic about it all, but I really have a feeling that that monopoly, monopoly capitalism will not let us come up. There, there has to Thank be you. some kind of showdown very soon, and that that's why we have to do something. Um, yeah, and then it was women here next. I'd like to start really with where Johnny finished up really, which is to ask the slightly rhetorical question, why are they doing it? It's because I think that really gets to the heart of what is happening here and perhaps gives us some ideas of what we can, can, can go. Because absolutely, the idea that when you've just passed 400 parts per million in the atmosphere of, of carbon dioxide, the idea that across the world, multinationals and companies are switching <coughs> to even more carbon intensive uh, methods of, uh, of extracting, extracting fuel is quite, is quite irrational and you would say in any rational society actually they'd be doing exactly the opposite. I do think it's worth us though reminding ourselves just how bad for the environment these things are. I mean the, the extreme forms of energy we're talking about, I mean we, here in Britain we know about fracking and to a lesser extent you know coal bed, coal bed methane and so on but in America and in particular North America where you, you have you know extraction of energy called mountain top removal, removal this is clearly not something that's good for the, the environment you only have to read some of the accounts of what's happened when they you know, deforested the areas the size of France to get out the, the tar sands and how that's impacted upon the local economy, the local environment and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. It also has you know, some other interesting facts. I mean, one of the problems with, say, fracking is the amount of energy you have to put in to get some out. You know, from the original oil wells, you burn the equivalent of a, a ten, a, a one barrel for every ten of energy you've got out now. And today, the ratio under fracking is you burn the equivalent of uh, of one barrel for every every four. So, actually, what to, to extract more and more energy, we're, quite, we're causing more and more damage to the environment. There's other impacts as well. The comrades from Lancashire here will know about things like the destruction of, lo of local planning legislation and uh, and and, uh, and so on. But you see, I want to argue that the reason this is happening is 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 because the absolutely way, uh, absolute way that fossil fuels are a part of capitalism, but really the logic of capitalism itself. You see, in Britain, who are the companies doing the fracking? It's people you've never heard of, Quadrilla. Who are they? Two men and a dog in a, in a shed somewhere in, in Lancashire. But actually, that's not how it's going to remain. And it's how it might have started in the States, but they will be swallowed up by the larger oil multinationals. That's what's happening in America. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of Exxon and BP who are, who are driving this process.
process. It's the logic of a capitalism reaching a point where they're now saying, where are tomorrow's profits coming from? Where are the profits down the road when the, when the oil starts to run out? Where is that, is that coming? And part of it is about energy security. Part of it is about saying, how can we protect our interests when Russia's withholding the oil and, and, the, and the gas and so on? But that's not, it's not enough. It's not enough to say this is about imperialism or war or, or, or whatever. It's about the, uh, the absolute nature of, of, of capitalism. And the, the other final point, really, is I think one of the impacts, and, and Johnny mentioned this, is the way it has become an excuse for business as usual. I think this is the other logic why the oil companies like it. It's because they, they don't have to change. They can say they're doing something, and governments can say, look, we're investing in this lower emissions form of generating energy, so you don't have to lose your car or turn your boiler down and all the rest of it. And you, above all, they don't need to invest in, uh, in renewable energy. And my final point, really, then, is to say, what does this mean in terms of the environmental movement? And crucially, what the socialists do. You see, I think uh, uh, the comrade who spoke earlier and says that socialists have to absolutely get involved in the direct action campaigns and, uh, and the protests against the camp, camp frack and the rest of it. I have to say, it was the coldest and wettest demonstration I've ever been on, and I'm glad I didn't have to camp over at, uh, at, camp, at camp frack. But actually, there's another thing. You see, the logic of fracking, the logic of mountaintop renewal, the, the logic of, um, of tar sands comes from the logic of capitalism. What we have to do is to take the logic of anti-capitalism into the environmental movement. The problem is the environmental movement in Britain is obsessed by fracking. The real problem in Britain, though, is not just fracking. It's the burn, continual burning of oil, of gas, the coal, the existing uh, fossil fuel things. We have to put an argument to the environmental movement. You have to now start looking outwards, start looking to a wider questioning of society. See, Jonathan Quick, that we shouldn't simply go and solve socialist worker. But actually, it's crucial we solve socialist worker at environmental movements because it's about putting out a bigger picture and a bigger strategy about changing the world and changing capitalism and stopping the oil national, uh, multinationals for good. I think I would quite like to add my recommendation to um, the, 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 for that book, The Burning Question, because that's something that takes the argument a bit further than we have had it up till now. And one of the things that really shook me rigid was that in its first chapter, it points out that the emissions uh, of the Earth, of carbon dioxide, for globally, um, have been on an exponential curve and that everything that we've done and quite a lot has been done in terms of building uh, alternative sources of energy and in terms of developing the, the clean energy market um, has not shown up on the emissions curve by one little tiny bit that the emissions keep on their absolute uh, trajectory upwards and upwards and upwards. And then it devotes a chapter on why this is, and more or less explains that when we save energy by uh, building wind farms and things like that, all that happens is that the, um, the, the oil that, we, that, that gets extracted from the ground is just sold somewhere else, and it's burnt anyway. So that, or even if we save money by having uh, <coughs> our roofs and, and, and having lower electricity bills as a result, we will go perhaps on another holiday, perhaps we will do something with that money, which means and everything that we do has a carbon footprint. Now I'm not going to go into everything that he explains, but <coughs> basically he's saying we can't just concentrate on alternative energy generation. We have to say that really what matters is how much of the, uh, of the carbon beneath the ground, the oil reserves and the carbon deposit reserves that all the companies are counting towards their share prices, they have to stay in the ground. And I think for us, that means that not only do we have to build a massive movement to try and stop it, but we have to change the, the focus of our target Okay, for our slogans on those demonstrations, we have to say, we have to really move quite explicitly against the people that are making money out of fossil fuels. And that, I think, is something that we haven't been doing quite so much up till now. Uh, and it's a matter of the kind of discussions we have with the environmentalists <coughs> and the kind of things that... Uh, that, that the, the target has to be different, or at any rate, slightly different to what it is now. It has, we have to move against the old companies, even though they are terrifyingly large and powerful. But 
we have to build something which is as terrifying to them as they are to us. Mm -hmm. okay. um, after this, comrade, it's the uh, this woman at the back. Um, hi, my name is Adam and I'm from Doncaster. And the point that I'd like to make that hasn't really been referred to so far is the use of uh, nuclear fusion in the future. And everybody's heard of nuclear fission, and it's basically where you take highly dense um, elements like uranium and plutonium, split them in half, and it produces a lot of energy. And this was hoped in the past to uh, help solve the sort of climate change crisis because the reaction in and of itself doesn't create very much free, very little uh, carbon dioxide. But of course, it has other um, dangers that of being sort of the radioactive waste, obviously, is stays radioactive for hundreds of hundreds of years and incredibly dangerous. But increasingly, um, a lot of scientists are looking to nuclear fusion as a potential alternative, which is, the, the science is very different, and nuclear fusion is what the sun does to produce energy. Rather than breaking atoms apart, you fuse two hydrogen atoms together to produce helium as well as extra energy. Um, it, the fuel can be salt water, um, it's radioactive fuel is it required, um, and it can produce a lot of energy without producing carbon emissions, and it's, it's, it's overall looks like a dream fuel, um, and it's being worked on by scientists all over Europe. There's a centre for study in Oxford, uh, near Cullum, and the recently developed institution in France. Uh, which should help for the, the, the development of this. And if this happens, then it allows near limitless production of uh, energy for a fraction of the cost that it does to uh, find uh, coal or oil or natural gas. Um, and I wonder what the, the speaker would think about the development of fuels such as that. Um, after this, comrade, we've got someone here on the end, and then I'll have to um, get Johnny to come and sum up for us. All right. Um, over the last couple of years in Canada, we've seen um, our own Tory government waging a war on the environment. Environmentalists have been called radicals, and you know, you know, what disturbers, and and people who are actually making um, oh my goodness, their lives difficult. The government and the companies, we can't make enough money. Hand over fist, we can't do it. You guys are getting in our way. You're letting people know what the actual problems are with taking up uh, the, the tar sands to turn into fuel, with, with fracking, um, with coal. And it's got to the point where in the last, I think, um, omnibus bill that was put through, because everything's being grouped into a bill, so it's 200 things that are being changed, and we can't even figure out what they are. The word environment Canada, the word environment has actually come out of that particular section of the government, it's no longer used. It's now a four-letter word. And what that has meant is the government has basically said um, it's a free-for-all in the country. What does that mean? I'm from British Columbia. And what's happening is the tar sands in Alberta, first of all, they're, it's nasty what's being taken out. It requires so much energy to do so, more energy and more water than you would ever believe that it's depleting a river and a natural gas um, supply in the north, uh, Northwest Territories in Northern Alberta because it, it, it does not want to come out of the ground. It's just a sludge that um, requires so much work that we're basically saying, okay, let's just destroy this whole particular part of the province. Rivers are being polluted, lakes are being polluted, um, First Nations communities, indigenous communities are finding um, cancers that have never been seen before and that are incredibly rare, occurring more and more frequently. And it's due to the horrible um, emissions that are coming out of the tar sands. What that means for my province is Enbridge wants to run a pipeline across the northern part of British Columbia, across some of the most um, remote, difficult, mountainous, tree-covered, snow-covered in the winter um, terrain that basically, let's be honest, there's absolutely no way that company will spend the money it's going to require to police that pipeline. You know what? I don't even know how they're going to build it because even just hiking in the southern part of the province where it's easy, it's not that easy. So what ended up happening was, I guess about a year ago, and some of you may have heard about this, is um, some maps were put out of the, the terminal at Kitimat where this pipeline is supposed to end. Now the coast of North America on the west coast, northwest coast, is tons and tons and tons of teeny tiny little islands. The Pacific Ocean hitting it, basically, there's nothing um, barring the waves coming in from 
the middle of the Pacific, and it's, it's absolutely nuts. There are search channels and everything. So what ended up coming out was that Enbridge had doctored the maps. They had removed islands to make the path of the pipelines look easier than it actually was going to be. And when this was found out, because you know people from British Columbia look at it and go, ah, uh, excuse me, no. They had nothing to say. They just went, no, 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 it's okay. We've got it sorted. Trust us. We don't trust them. Um, there's been a huge movement of the First Nations people who live on that coast, who have lived there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This has probably been the best part of the, the tar sands extraction process, is that it's the First Nations communities have started to fight back. They have started to speak louder. They've started to have their voice heard. Um, Another comrade mentioned the Idle No More movement. Um, this was something that a lot of these people put their voices into. And even Thanks in so British Columbia, we had our own um, rally called Defend Our Coast in October of last year. And they were at the forefront of this struggle um, to do that. Um, so to sum up, why is this happening? Again, it's the irrationality of capitalism. We need to keep accumulating. We need to keep making stuff. We need to do this, apparently. I don't think we do, um, but that's why we need to keep extracting, and we're getting to this point where we need to keep taking out these horrible, um, extreme energies out of the ground, um, and really we need to create a system where we can actually think rationally and logically and plan things in a way where we don't necessarily have to do this in this way or at all. Thank you. On June the 8th, Yep. On June the 8th, there was a climate crisis conference at London Metropolitan University, well attended. And I talked to an environmentalist afterwards um, who said, I haven't realised how trade unionists viewed this. You know, it's quite new to this person who's been quite, it's quite young, but you know, campaign environmental issues about the involvement of trade unions. So that meeting was very successful and I think it needs to be replicated. Because we need to draw the climate scientists, the environmentalists, trade unions, and socialists together. We've got to get more informed core. And also because we've got very little time. The burning question makes the point that on current CO2 emissions, within 17 years, we will pass the 2 degrees centigrade threshold. And that will be incredibly serious. Two other points I want to make given the time. One is an um, interesting campaign called Campaign for Energy Democracy, started from the US College <coughs> University, aimed at trade unions, and the central argument is to be successful, we have got to get back under public control our gas, coal, energy, you know, we've got to get the energy companies back under public control. They leave it to private capital, we were on to a loser. The other thing I um, mentioned, I'm not going to counterpose this to mass movements at all, but there's, kept, there's been a campaign share action, which has been set up, it's quite widely based. The public face of the campaign is going to start in October of this year, and essentially it's going to be a detailed campaign about mobilising people on control of the pension funds. The pension funds are putting loads of money into the oil, gas, and so on. And the campaign is about how we can turn this around and not have them investing there, but have them investing in renewables, etc. It's going to be quite a long campaign, quite difficult, but I think it's going to be done. back in to sum up. Okay, thanks. And thanks for an interesting discussion. I want to um, just make a few points. Um, the first one, um, Brian raised the, the, the issue of uh, how firms lie about exploitable resources. That's absolutely true um, because share prices rely uh, uh, very much on proven oil reserves. Um, that, is, that, that is very much the case. I think though that what we have to do is that when we look at the figures, not just in terms of proven oil reserves, and what proven oil reserves mean are uh, reserves that are technically re uh, and economically recoverable uh, given the current uh, uh, circumstances in terms of prices and technology um, 
uh, but the, on top of those, you also have unproven reserves and then total reserves. The total reserves is what um, Brian means when he says that that's the total amount there, but there's no way that you can get most of that. But we are seeing um, a, a, an increase in proven reserves all around the world. Um, now, an element of that is undoubtedly inflation uh, uh, on the basis of share price. But when we look at the total um, amount uh, of stuff that's in the ground, uh, which, as Eva says, and I think that we do have to say must stay in the ground, it's quite clear that there is enough there to bake the world uh, a, a number of times over, given, even given the existing level um, of technology. Um, and I think that that is why it feeds into what the, what the comrade who spoke afterwards said, the, the, the time limit on socialism. Although, I think that we have to be careful when we go, when we talk like that, because it's, uh, as as, as uh, I think it was uh, Gareth Dale said that uh, it, 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 he would fight for the it'd be better to fight for uh, a, a damaged socialist world. <laughs> you know, it would be better to have a damaged socialist world uh, than to carry on living in uh, in a lovely capitalist world where the climate is is nice. No, I think there are you know I, I'd like to have both, but I think that that's a very important consideration, which is that as the environmental crisis goes on, this will exacerbate. Uh, social tensions and social problems, which will lead to more um, political uh, and social uh, turmoil and eruptions. And so I think that uh, increasingly, I think in the future, you will see an intertwining of environmental, political and social um, issues uh, such as that. I want to echo the, the, the stuff about the South China Sea is very, very important. Um, there's an article um, in the last issue of uh, the ISJ by Ha Young Kim on instability in, uh, in, in the region that I would recommend uh, everybody, everybody uh, have a look at. Um, on the question of, of nuclear fusion, yeah, it'd be fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do it. Um, and, you know, I'm all in favor of spending lots and lots of money on, uh, invest, uh, on, 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 on science and trying, to, uh, and trying to develop it. But there's no way that we could develop uh, some kind of strategy on the basis that at some point in the future we're going to get um, that we're going to get nuclear fusion as, as, as nice as that would be. Uh, that's not to say that it's not possible, and that's not to say that we won't get it at some point in the future. Um, but I do think that really uh, the points that, that Martin raised, I think, are really, really crucially uh, important. Uh, as I was saying, the, 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 the process that we've already seen in just the last six years has been one in which very small independent operators in the... Um, in the, uh, in the shale plays in the United States have gone on to be gobbled up by bigger and bigger and bigger uh, corporations. Uh, and this is something that will continue to go on and on for the, for the reasons that Martin um, outlined. And it is part um, of the logic of capitalism, and this is unescapable. I think the other thing that we have to bear in mind is that as capitalism ages and as the units of capital become bigger and bigger, you have the development of a situation in which it becomes very, very difficult to, uh, for, for, for new entrants onto the scene to, uh, to assail them. Um, that you end up with huge uh, economic units whose importance is so big that they're described as too big to fail. And this is certainly the case when you're talking about the oil giants, which make up some of the biggest, um, of the biggest uh, corporations in the world. It's a, it's a, a process that Michael Kidron described, uh, he talked about sclerotic capitalism. You get to the point where units of capital are so huge that when they go down, uh, they threaten to drag the rest of the economy behind them. We had a taste of this when Lehman Brothers uh, went under. Uh, and this is the kind of scale that we're talking about of these huge corporations. And they are not, they're interested in putting on a show of developing uh, green energy, of developing, um, of developing less uh, emitting energy, but that's not what they're about. What they're about is profit, and they will carry on exploiting uh, the best areas of profit, which remain the exploitation <coughs> of fossil fuels, and that will go on and on uh, and will threaten the future of the planet. Um, I want to echo what uh, both Jonathan and Martin said about the need uh, to build a movement against it, and I think that what Martin says about bringing anti-capitalism into the climate movement um, it, it is, is absolutely right. You do get uh, an, an impression that, yeah, you do get an impression sometimes in Britain that the environmental movement has gone from a very, very big peak 
just before the, the wave demonstration a few years ago. Then you had the, the, the uh, Copenhagen conference, which disappointed and demoralized so many, and it's dipped quite a lot. The fracking movements, I think, uh, as well as being limited, though, are optimistic. They are a positive sign uh, that we can see um, more, uh, more and more developments. But bringing a socialist message into the heart of those movements uh, and being part of them and building them as part of them, not as being as outsiders who are, who, are just, uh, who are just lecturing to them, I think is absolutely crucial. Because I think that more and more, as you look at the development of the climate crisis and the economic crisis, the argument that this can be dealt with under capitalism, by capitalism, is becoming more and more threadbare. And that does mean that some people will become more and more demoralized, but more and more people will also be open to more radical uh, possibilities, to more radical uh, explanations. And that includes the explanation that to get rid of the climate crisis once and for all, you really do have to smash capitalism. That does mean a workers' revolution, and that does mean building a revolutionary party like the Socialist Workers' Party. So if you're not a member, I'd urge you to join. Thank you.